This is Deborah Tavares. We're picking up a um, terrific plant that is being furthered by Rothschild and Rockefeller, as I will explain during uh, this conversation. It's a very, very important to know that everything that the corporations and the international bankers have been doing is one gigantic fraud, and it's all our expense. We're paying for all of this. Um, the agenda, of course, as we know, is disinformation and manipulation by the international bankers' corporate structure to centralize control of all people, land, energy, resources, technologies, and economies, and we must look at the hidden secret behind these corporations and universities and institutions that are set to control all the emerging technologies that uh, were are planned to rebuild the world's transportation, civil, manufacturing, physical infrastructure with cyber infrastructure, including computers, networks, sensors, and the transhumanism agenda. Extremely important to understand that we are being transformed through the increase of frequencies. This is why when you think of you in Agenda 21, too many people using too much stuff, you have to understand this is a genocide program. We are being moved now into what they call resilient cities. And it's important to get this word out, start looking it up resilient cities. Understand what this is. This is a plan brought in by Rothschild and Rockefeller. And I'm going to go over what resilient cities are and how they're coming in. It is diabolical and exactly what you're facing right now and likely unaware. But I'm first going to read you a press release from the Rothschild Global Advisory. It says, Rothschild and Company names Homer Parkhill and Stephen Antonelli as co-heads of restructuring North America. They plan on restructuring North America. The new leadership better positions the firm's restructuring practice for the future. Rothschild Global Advisory, one of the world's leading independent financial advisory groups, has announced it has promoted these uh, two men to co-head the restructuring of North America effective immediately. This press release is dated out of New York, October 30th, 2017. They say that they have uh, been part of the senior leadership of the firm's restructuring practice for many years and will continue to be based in New York. They have announced these promotions uh, and the head of Rothschild North America said, in looking at our priorities for building the business in North America, the leadership of Rothschild felt that now was the time to elevate Homer and Steve to this role. This is an important move for Rothschild as we ensure the firm is in a strong position in this market for many, many years to come. We are truly excited about the future this group will bring under this new leadership. They go on to say that over the past year, Rothschild has taken significant steps in strengthening and expanding its presence in North America. Rothschild announced that Chris Garner joined the firm as global head of technology and will lead the firm's new office in Silicon Valley. So what we are seeing is the announcement, Rothschild & Company, of course, is a family-controlled and independent business, bankers, that has been at the center of the world's financial markets for over 200 years. So they are set to restructure North America. And I don't believe that any one of us wants Rockefeller and Rothschild to restructure North America, but they have plans to do that. And we're going to talk about how they are luring our cities, our communities, all the corporate boards into this resilience um, program that they're bringing in. Now, again, before I've talked often about the climate action plans, which are, of course, sustainability plans that promote uh, desired agendas, this is backed by 
by the RAND, R-A-N-D, Corporation. The RAND Corporation is behind uh, the government uh, policies. I know that many of us scratch our heads when we hear our elected officials uh, say we believe at least they're elected officials. We all need to understand that we have a corporate government uh, takeover. We do not have a government. Well, people will say, well, there would be anarchy if we did not have a government. Well, we have a corporate um, facilitator uh, globally, and part of it is through the RAND Corporation. Now, I'm jumping from climate action plans just to read something that is absolutely critical on page 11 of the Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars is a, a um, declaration of war against the United States and all global human populations. It is a genocide plan. So here is what it says again on page 11. Since energy is the key to all activity on the face of the planet, it follows that in order to attain a monopoly of energy, raw materials, goods, and services, and to establish a world system of slave labor, it was necessary to have first strike capability in the field of economics. In order to maintain Rothschild and Rockefeller's position, it was necessary that they have absolute first knowledge of the science of control over all economic factors. And the first experience at engineering, the first experience at engineering the world economy. So they go on, in order to achieve their sovereignty, the elite's sovereignty, they must at least achieve this one end, that the public will not make either the logical or mathematical connection between economics and the other energy sciences or learn to apply such knowledge. So with that having been said, I want everybody to play, pay close attention to how they are maneuvering these strategies through our country through the vehicle of the RAND Corporation. And uh, we have to first understand that the word consensus is um, – a format that is presented by trained facilitators to come into each of our communities in all levels of corporate government setups because we have been now um, taken. We're no longer um, uh, we're no longer the country we believe, and many people sadly still believe we have. We still many people still believe that voting changes things. It doesn't. We're run by consensus. We're run by groupthink. What does that mean? Well. I tried on many occasions to join citizen advisory boards here in Northern California. There was one caveat, that I would have to agree on the majority of the decision being made. In other words, if I or a couple of other people did not agree with the direction of the um, understanding, we would have to be quiet and go ahead and agree anyway. So we know that group think uh, is made uh, to, to conform to popular opinion, and we get overpowered by the most energetic people. Group think destroys a good thing, as we have been told when we look at the definition for consensus. They say consensus is the middle ground in decision-making between total assent and total disagreement. Consensus depends on, on people involved having shared values and goals and on having broad agreement on specific issues and overall direction. Consensus implies that everyone accepts and supports the decision and understands the reasons for making it. So that was the criteria that we are being told if we attempt to get on a citizen's advisory board, which is to lure all of us into believing that we have impact. We don't. This is a very stealthily woven web of deceit and how we are being maneuvered in every single, every, every single city and every city agency throughout the country and the globe. And what I want to talk about is uh, what we're seeing here right now 
in Sonoma County, Northern California, after this horrific um, fire that we've all had to endure. Um, we just uh, had a meeting this morning. The city is, is, of course, very concerned. They're literally blowing through their money in removing all of the fire debris, and they're running out of money. So they're having these meetings. They're all controlled by facilitators. And we will have that up on StopTheCrime.net. Um, so I would urge all of you to see this process in action so that you understand the magnitude. We, all of us here in Northern California, have experienced the worst and costliest fire in U.S. history. And now Rothschild and Rockefeller are coming in. They're moving in. So what does consensus mean? Well, Again, it's pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation, and it has a very, very ambitious goal. It's to help cities worldwide build resilience to the growing social, economic, and physical challenges of the 21st century of climate change. Now, climate change, as we know, is the weaponized control of the weather that is being denied on every level. In fact, those that bring up the weaponized control of the weather are considered terrorists and anti-government, and um, we're being categorized as lunatics. But we know that the weather is massively and completely artificially controlled. So their plan goes on to say, the intertwined forces of globalization, urbanization, and climate change are putting pressure on cities like never before. But by transforming how we think, plan, and operate, cities can turn these challenges into opportunities. Now they're talking about their opportunities for finance, financial gain. Let me back up. The climate action plans and the energy action plans that all of your cities have approved several years ago were um, facilitated not only by the facilitating team, the economic hitmen that come in and uh, literally control the city's agendas, but the cities took grants in order to implement and approve these climate action plans. Now think of it like this. You're a builder, and you have a set of plans drawn, and you pay the architect for those set of plans. But the building of those plans has not yet happened. And I'm going to discuss... and the energy action plans that all of your cities, all of your counties have previously already adopted. Those plans are in place, and I remind you, you can type in the name of your city, followed by climate action plan or energy action plan, and you can read their over 150-page document in most instances. Again, I was talking about the Delphi meetings and how these plans were structured and how they were facilitated by uh, communication techniques that have been used in all the meetings today to manipulate and reach uh, predetermined outcomes for desired goals of Rothschild and Rockefeller and the nest of and weaving of corporations who are behind these meetings. We've talked about the Delphi meeting system and how it's been used for climate action plan meetings to create the illusion of public agreement, a.k.a. consensus, to determine consensus science rather than real fact-based science. So, again, climate action plans are based upon false consensus science. We know that. We know that the use of weather control on all levels is really the climate change that we are seeing. So now we have the stealth movement coming in to restructure North America. And they're telling us that the next frontier of climate change is resilience. So prior to the break, I was telling you, the climate action plans, again, are improved in all of your cities. Your cities took grants and money to approve those plans and to say, yes, they will do those plans. 
and I was likening that to a builder who would ask for a set of plans to be drawn up by an architect. The builder would then pay for those set of plans, and the plans would sit there. The plan is now being built by the resilient policies that are rolling in now. Most of the United States has been massively affected by chaos of weaponized weather assaults. We are now ripe for the taking. It required years and, and, and many years of property loss, death, destruction by weather weapons to position the Rothschild and Rockefeller idea of the restructuring of North America. So with the new frontier of climate change resilient policies rolling in, here's what we're understanding. We're talking uh, about what Judith Roden, president of the Rockefeller Foundation, said, um, and she is out of the University of Pennsylvania. She says, as the world turns its attention to the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris, the global community is hoping for fresh ideas to solve our increasing climate-related challenges. We know that climate accelerates and complicates almost every other problem, from food insecurity and water scarcity to conflicts and refugee crises around the world. In this increasingly interconnected world, only real and lasting resilience achieved by way of innovative systems and deep approaches will solve our problems into the future. And they talk about some of the potential game-changing trends that Roth Rockefeller and Rothschild believe are part of the next frontier of climate resilience. They go on to tell us that one of the great challenges for the cities and other municipalities is the persistent global funding gap for tools to meet pressing challenges. I'm going to tell you this right now. Okay, the stressors that they're identifying as a result of climate change and the reason that we need to bring in urban resiliency, urban, we're talking city, this resilience program is designed to move us all into the cities. UN Agenda 21 policies that everyone's aware of, the Wildlands Project moving us from uh, country rural lands into urban um literally imposing a grid of frequencies around us in these resilient cities was really the plan all along. Again, I've I said many, many times you have to think of UN Agenda 21 policies, too many people using too much stuff as a plan of genocide, which it is. So the Rothschild Rockefeller says, well, what is urban resilience? Well, they tell us cities face a growing range of adversities and challenges in the 21st century from effects of climate change to growing migrant populations to inadequate infrastructure to pandemics to cyber attacks. Resilience is what helps cities adapt and transform in the face of these challenges, helping them to prepare for both the expected and the unexpected. We're going to continue this on the other side of this break. This is crucial for everyone to understand what is occurring right now. Tavares, and we are discuss discussing the urban resilient plans that Rockefeller and Rothschild are bringing in to North America for the restructuring of North America. So again, I would recommend that everyone type in resilient cities and understand what we all face. We've explained how these uh, stealth strategies and policies are moving into our cities are, that are incorporated do not serve us, and through grants and facilitators and the um, consensus agreement where no one, everyone has to agree with the uh, majority is how we are getting this lawless, corrupt uh, requirement of changing our lives, and we're going to talk about that, but I'm continuing with the definition of city resilience. 
So the uh, resilient cities defines urban resilience as the as the capability of and the capacity of individuals and communities and institutions and businesses and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kinds of chronic stresses the acute shocks they experience will be. Wait a minute. We can survive no matter what kind of acute shocks we experience when they're using weather weapons to hit us? They go on to tell us, building urban resilience requires looking at a city holistically, understanding the systems that make up the city and the interdependencies and risks they will face. By strengthening the underlying fabric of a city and better understanding the potential shocks and stresses it may face, a city can improve its development trajectory trajectory, and the well-being of its citizens. This is how they're selling this. So they're listing some of the chronic stresses. Chronic stresses are slow-moving disasters that weaken the fabric of the city, and they include high unemployment, overtaxed or inefficient public transportation systems, endemic violence, chronic food and water shortages, acute shocks, and then they say, Acute shocks are sudden, sharp events that threaten the city, including earthquakes, floods, disease, outbreaks, and terrorist attacks. And they go on to say the challenges that cities face are often uh, not just a single shock or stress, but many shocks and stress. Most cities face a combination of all of these challenges, which can contribute to further threatening a city's resilience. And they cite the example of Hurricane Katrina, which hit the southeastern U.S. in 2005 with devastating consequences. But it wasn't the hurricane alone that led to such a crisis in the city of New Orleans. They say that the storm's impact was exacerbated by stresses like institutional racism, violence, divestment, and aging infrastructures, poverty, lack of microeconomic transformation, environmental degradation, and other chronic challenges. Now let's talk about this. Lack of environmental degradation. We have failing infrastructure. We have the um, nest of networks, fish and wildlife, that is prohibiting the cleaning of our, of our creeks that overflow wipe out many roads, make it safe for, unsafe for us to travel, and they are adding all these challenges to us because this is all part of a Rothschild Rockefeller takeover by using these agencies. They go on to say the compounding pressure of these unaddressed stresses undermine the city's resilience. And when a terrible shock hits the city, it's exposed and exacerbated its weaknesses and ultimately making it's far more difficult for the city to bounce back. I'm going to add right now, Northern California has had such a shock. This was an intentional hit using directed energy weapons. The fires that broke out the night of October 8, 2017, were multiple. There were over 30 fires throughout many counties, not just Sonoma County, that started to burn this northern area of California down. Over 8,000 homes were lost. Um, we have had many businesses shut down. All the businesses that are still um, operating have certainly experienced tremendous loss of business. And we have really literally hundreds and thousands of people displaced. They're wandering around the city with PTSD. They're living in trailers. They're staying with friends. They're trying to live in Airbnb homes that Northern California is known as the wine country. So most many people that own uh, homes on the coast or even near the San Francisco Bay Area rent their additional houses out under Airbnb. It's important to understand Airbnb is a global takedown of and sopping up the local month-to-month -month occupancy for local people. Airbnb is run by Google. And the intention is to displace people globally 
they say in their um, mission statement, more or less, that any home, wherever you are, is where you are. And this is all compacting to the transition and the uh, the lack of of community as we have transient people continuously coming in and out. But I'm going to go into um, the Reliance Pledge that each of our cities are being encouraged to sign by money. Again, this is going to be a repayment that will be required of this money. But here's the pledge, Detailed Reliance Pledge. Again, this is from Rothschild and Rockefeller. 10% resilient pledge proposal. One objective of the City Leaders Summit is to generate concrete outcomes that city leaders can take away from their time spent at the summit. To meet these objectives, Resilient Cities and City Leaders Summit Leadership Committee would like to present the 10% resilient pledge proposal for city leaders. Now understand, here's what they're pledging. Under the 10% Resilient Pledge, a city leader pledges to commit the equivalent of 10% of the city's budget per year in support of the city's defined resilient goals and activities. They go on to say that for those cities with an existing resilient strategy, The goal is to make these committed resources available no later than the start of the city's financial year of 2017. For cities that are developing their resilient strategy, the goal is to incorporate this pledge into the strategy. It's important to understand what this pledge is saying because this is really horrific. This is how we are being deceived with all our incorporated cities that do not carry our wishes as people. Again, we are the enemy. Senate Report 93549, we do not have a functioning government. And we're going to talk about who is the functioning government in a moment. But I'm going to finish reading this pledge. For each city whose city leader takes the 10% resilient pledge, they will seek to provide the city, that's Rockefeller and Rothschild, will seek to provide the city with five million U.S. dollars worth of goods and services from the resilient platform of partners, subject to the city's ability to handle the resources and the dictations of the city's resilient strategy. In other words, to finance resiliency over the next five years and during the course of the city's active participation in resilient cities. The member city to support the city's um, efforts to build resilience. Further information and illustrative examples of how the pledge might be met are available for further uh, review. And again, they have a sample of the detailed resilient pledge. Uh, Again, it is a 10% resilient pledge statement. You're to insert the city leader's name that they pledge that they – their city, they put in the name of their city, will commit to the equivalent of 10% of the city's budget per annum to fund defined resilient goals. Now let's talk about how this is happening. Again, we talked about the Delphi technique. We talked about consensus, um, certainly defining the narrative, creating false um, agreements, and it's important to understand who is bringing this all in. Um, and, And certainly it's not solely the RAND Corporation, but the RAND says this. Now, the RAND Corporation um, is an American nonprofit global policy think tank, and it was created in 1948. And the the research and analysis uh, was to give the United States Air Force more information. It is financed, the RAND is financed by the U.S. government and private endowment corporations, universities, and private individuals. The company has grown to assist governments, international organizations, and private companies and foundations all over the world. We're going to continue with the brand's definition, and we're going to talk about how they instruct Congress to vote on summer breaks. We come back. Again, this is Debbie 
said this to Maris, I am talking about uh, how the country is being run by corporations, Rothschild and Rockefeller, mainly funded. Uh, it is very, very important to understand that the RAND, R-A-N-D, corporation, and how they are involved in drafting up the very policies that our fake politicians read. They don't, they don't read uh, before they vote on policies. We've heard that time and time again, but they vote on it anyway. The next question is, if they haven't read it and they don't know what it is, then they haven't written it. So who is writing it? And we're identifying that now. But I first want to state to you that the RAND does control governments and international organizations, private companies and foundations, and even the defense globally. They are also involved in health care. And the American locations of the RAND is the headquarters in Santa Monica, California. They are in Arlington, Virginia, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the San Francisco Bay Area, Boston, Massachusetts. The RAND Gulf State Policy Institute has an office in New Orleans, Louisiana, and the RAND Europe is located in Cambridge, United Kingdom, and Brussels, Belgium. RAND Australia is located in Canterbury, Australia. Again, they create programs for public policy, and they address and analyze on real-world problems, and they shape everything under the idea that we have climate change. Every policy is based upon climate change. This is where now the resilient cities are coming in. The resilient cities is now how they're going to build the climate action plans that our cities have already agreed to and accepted grant money. And I read to you the pledge that the cities will be making a 10% contribution to resilient cities um, annually of their budget, 10%. Now let's talk about what we found on the RAND website. They talked about, and this is just one example of many, but this is important to understand. Again, RAND runs governments, and many other agencies do as well. But the RAND is funded by Rockefeller and Rothschild and other private um, contributions as well. But they say this, the summer of 2015 reading list for Congress, a reading list for Congress. This is put out by the RAND. They say this, with the House adjourned for the summer and the Senate set to wrap up later this week, the strenuous pace in Washington will slow somewhat, offering a welcome break for busy congressional staff. However, important issues remain on the table for the fall season. So RAND has developed a list of must-read research and commentaries that will help ensure that policymakers are ready to dive right back in the fall. And some of the things that they had on their summer reading list was the Iran, Iran nuclear deal, uh, cyber security, and they talk about transportation funding, uh, reauthorizing the uh, elementary and secondary education. They go on to say how the House and the Senate can pass bills reauthorizing the Elementary and Secondary Education Act this year and that policy differences in each chamber's respective bills and conference process for ironing them out is expected to carry over into the fall in a series of commentaries and experts from RAND Education have compiled recommendations for Congress as it works to revamp the long-expired law. Researchers address a variety of issues, including requirements for testing, the federal role in improving schools, and how Congress can help boost teaching. Now, we know from the Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars that the RAND and the educational process has been um, controlled. It's all part of the Silent Weapons uh, system. And an excerpt from the Silent Weapons War um, is this about education, and this is on page 7 
of silent weapons for a quiet war. Quote, the quality of education given to the lower class must be of the poorest sort, so that the moat of ignorance isolating the inferior class from the superior class is and remains incomprehensible to the inferior class. With such an initial handicap, even bright lower class individuals have little, if any, hope of extricating themselves from their assigned lot in life. This form of slavery is essential to maintain some measure of social order, peace, and tranquility for the ruling upper class. So as I read to you the summer reading list provided the actors in Congress and all of our congressional illusion of a government that is presented them to them by the RAND Corporation, it is important to understand where then those policies are, are occurring. Here's what they t uh, talk and tell the uh, congressional members who, again, are puppets. We always use the word puppets. They are actors. And the RAND Corporation and others are supplying the script for these policymakers that we believe are policymakers that don't read the bills and approve them. So here's what RAND says on transportation funding. The U.S. Highway Trust Fund is running on fumes after passage of a short-term extension. As Congress debates a long-term fix, questions remain about how to finance the package in an era in which the gas tax is no longer cutting it. To answer these questions, some state and federal policy makers have begun to explore a shift from taxing fuel to taxing vehicle miles traveled. These fees could be structured to reduce congestion, emissions, and wear and tear on the roads. However, transitioning to vehicle miles traveled fees would introduce key challenges from public resistance stemming from privacy concerns, multiple technology and systems requirements and choices, and the administrative challenge of collecting fees directly from millions of drivers rather than the status quo of levying taxes on a smaller number of fuel, or fuel wholesalers. They go on, but they talk about the Western drought and climate change resilience, again, part of the Congress's summer reading list. Here's what they talk about that. With the West facing a persistent drought and devastating start to wildfire season, wildfire, again, is a season. It's a market of destruction. It is intentional. They are not allowing the resources. They have sprayed us with strontium, barium, and aluminum. Our forests are erupting because of the millions of dead and dying trees. They have fueled these fires, and they are increasingly hotter because of the combustibility of all the heavy metals that have been sprayed on us. So we first must understand the enormity of the structure that we face. So they go on to tell us and tell our congressmen, again, who do not serve us. The United States is a de facto government, and it exists in name only. And we've talked about James Trafficant, who was the representative of Ohio, and how for years he would put on congressional record the fact that the United States was bankrupt. <laughs> 